Right. Wonderful. So thanks everybody so much for joining us this evening for our session around staying safe with our group whilst we're outdoors, which is hopefully what lots of us have been doing, even in this kind of temperamental summer weather that we've been having. My group's definitely been enjoying some outdoor activities, uh, maybe not as many as we used to in July, but that is life. So I'm Lauren and I work at Wacraffolk as a program manager. And we're also here tonight with Owen, who is our head of membership and program. And we're going to be taking you through the webinar this evening. If at any point you want to interrupt us, uh, please do so. Unmute yourself or put a question in the chat and we will get to answer it as we go along. So what are we going to talk about this evening? We're going to look at what we're already doing to stay safe with our groups when we're doing outdoor activities. We're going to look at what we expect uh, as kind of head office uh, what we expect all our groups to be doing to ensure that we're staying safe when we're outside. We're going to talk about why we're doing it. So why are we doing outdoor activities as well as why we're kind of talking about it right now. We're going to look at responding to incidents. So what we can do when things do um, go wrong or when we need to kind of escalate things and where you can find more support and information. And then, as I said, at the end, we'll have some time for questions. If people have some questions about things that have happened or things that are coming up, then Owen and I will do our best to answer those questions um, at the end, either in the chat or unmute yourself if you would like to um, tell us what are we already doing um, and how are we mitigating risk when we're doing outdoor activities um, and also who is responsible for making sure this happens. So I guess let's start with what uh, people in the room are already doing uh whilst we're doing outdoor activities and how we're mitigating risk and staying safe if anybody wants to put in the chat or unmute themselves please feel free to um uh, you know off, 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 off hand i can think of you know when we're when we're out hiking we always try to keep an adult at the front an adult at the back and we make it clear that um I don't know if I'm going into too much detail immediately. I don't know. No, we, make no, it clear, right. we make it clear that the person at the front knows that no one should be in front of them and the person at the back should know that no one's behind them. And that way, that way we try and kettle them into, uh, into the zone in between the front and the back. Um, and if, if someone falls behind, got to do a shoelace up or cuts a knee or something, then, then you know, we try and get everyone to stop or we get an adult to stay with them. And then the, the rear adult is aware that something is going on behind. And it's all about communication between the adults. And um, yeah, that's just something that came into my head immediately then. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that sounds like a really good way of mitigating risk whilst we're out, out on walks, which we all, uh, lots of our groups like to do. Um, I think definitely you hit the nail on the head with that. It's all about communication, making sure that we're sort of talking about who's going at the front and also communicating that with the young people who are on the walk as well and ensuring that they understand why we have that sometimes young people aren't always understanding because they want to be right at the front of the action um, and ahead of everybody else or they're a bit tired and want to be right at the back of the action and not be not be with everybody else so it's really good to kind of think about that in advance and think of ways that often similarly I, I do the same thing and have somebody at the front somebody at the back and if there are those young people that want to be ahead of the group or at the front of the group they can hold the map and they can help read the map. They can help direct the walk, but do that in line with the other adults as well. Um, so that they're just keeping in, in the eyesight of everybody who's there. Perfect. Cool. Anything else that groups think? I've just seen Nancy Sorry, popped a couple of queries in the chat, which perhaps will sweep up towards the end, um, <laughs> along with any other questions. Maybe we'll park those for the moment. Perfect. Um, I can see some um, other bits in the yep, chat as yep, well. Yep. All right, cool. Nancy's risk assessment. It, it definitely gets read, Nancy. There you I, are, you see. You, I don't you, believe you, Mike. <laughs> I don't believe you for a second. <laughs> well, only because it's such utter common sense. It's just, it's already in, in, in us all by osmosis. <laughs> Excellent. But, but I think Nancy's point is that she writes the risk assessment and there's not particularly um you know everyone everyone's just you know they're they're busy that they're busy arriving on the train to to get to the to the walk or whatever we're doing and it's, 
and um, it's not necessarily. Um, I'm not sure what the right word. Yeah, is. that's. I I I get where she's coming from. I also get where you're coming from. Maybe we will we will cover that in a little bit when we get on to talking about risk assessment in a bit more detail. Um, that that seems like something we can definitely cover. Um, I'm, I wasn't. I wasn't. I must be clear. I wasn't trying to undermine the importance of that risk assessment there. No, no, we understand. We we're understand. we're on the same page as you. It's all right. Yeah. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I can see in the chat that other people have put things like bringing a first aid kit um, to do activities outdoors, which is very sensible, very helpful, a uh, good way to deal with uh, things if they come up. We've also got somebody saying that they stick to the ratios, which is also really important for having enough adults to support the young people. <clears throat> and also mentioning there about one-to-one -one support if there are young people who have specific needs, which I think is something really worth bearing in mind, especially when we're outdoors uh, and thinking about those young people who need uh, that one-to-one -one support or um, different young people who need different support maybe when we're doing activities outdoors or in a place that we haven't done activities before. These are all really good um, things and I'm glad to hear that, that groups are thinking about them. So we've put here who's responsible for making this happen. We've heard that there are people making risk assessments, which is great. We're sharing them. It's everybody's responsibility to make sure that these things happen. So just some things here about staying safe um, in Woodcraft Oak in general and things that we should be sticking to when we're indoors, outdoors, uh, in all doors. So making sure that we've informed parents what we're doing, uh, getting their parents and carers consent for taking their young people to do activities where we're doing them and letting them know what we're doing, where we're doing it. Looking at volunteer screening, DBS and PBG checks, all of the things that you'll have heard before, making sure that you've got at least two adults who are DBS checked and or PBG checked and full members of Woodcraft Folk. Making sure, as somebody's already mentioned, that we're meeting our adult to child ratios. So just a reminder, that is one to three for wood chips, one to five for elfins, one adult to every eight pioneers and one to 10 for venturers. Making sure that when we're doing outdoor activities or any activities with our young people, that we've got the health information and emergency contacts so we can contact parents, carers, guardians, should we need to. Making sure that we're doing appropriate reporting and record keeping, which we'll talk about a bit later. Making sure we've got risk assessments, which we're about to come to. Making sure that we're avoiding one-to-one -one contact with young people and making sure that our uh, volunteers have all undergone some form of safeguarding training, which I'll give us a link to at the end. So I'll pass over to Owen to talk about risk assessment. Cool, thank you, Lauren. Um, yeah, so the center of like how we control risk and how we keep things safe and also how we evidence that we've done it is through typically a written risk assessment. Um, and to kind of touch on touch on Nancy's point here, clearly what we're doing is we're identifying what the risk is, what the threats are, um, how severe that is, and how we have to control it. So what can we put in place to make it make it less uh, and make it manageable? Um, what you are working towards here is a shared understanding, certainly shared among all of the adults who are going to be there because I know you know typically one person will actually take responsibility for writing it down and documenting it and sending it to everybody and going have you seen the risk assessment that I sent you um, but actually if it's something that exists only in the mind of one person then it ain't going to keep anybody safe what's really important is that shared understanding um, and ideally the risk assessment is not something that one person is sent off to do and they do it in isolation. It is effectively, you know, a documented version of that shared understanding of that consensus that you've come to. If you like the minutes of the meeting, a record of the conversation that you've had. Um, if I'm honest, the risk assessment is the written risk assessment is important because there's an audit trail there. If something was to go wrong, it's important that we've documented it. It helps people embed it and understand it. But the really important bit, the bit that actually keeps people safe is not a piece of paper in a folder. It's the conversations that you've had about how you're going to do it and how you're going to put it into, put it into practice. And 
you know, if you find yourself in a position where you are basically the person who goes, oh, you know, Nancy's good at risk assessments or who, whatever it is, um, you need to be just kind of mindful that don't get cast just in that role and make sure that you are sharing that. Some people love to take information in through a written document. Other people really don't engage with it in that way. And maybe the kind of opening circle where you go, and what do we always do when we're going on a walk, as Mike was saying earlier, um, you know, no one in front of me, no one behind Lauren, just doing that reminder asking the questions using that almost like Socratic method to get them to regurgitate what you know and they know and they understand to check for that comprehension to check it's made in uh, into their minds is, is, is really helpful um, it should be something that you're talking about actively when you go uh, when you're meeting with adults to, to plan your events and your activities um, but just that little check-in to go, and what do we always do? Or how do you think, you know, pioneers, venturers, whatever they are, we can manage this risk um, and make sure that they're on the same page as you and they understand the boundaries. Um, then, that's, then that's a really important part of the process. Um, if they are just documents that get filed in a, in a folder until something goes wrong, then that's not really what a risk assessment is supposed to do. You've got the pieces in place to kind of, you know, keep the insurers happy, but is it a living document that keeps people safe? No, it's the conversations, the live discussions that happen about it uh, that keep people safe. Um, we can move on, Lauren, to the next slide. Um, just to remind you, when you're doing that risk assessment, when you're having that discussion, um, almost you know this is an exhaustive list but if you if you tick off that you thought about each of these things um then you'll be halfway to making sure that you've identified the the relevant stuff um so risks could be environmental they could be related to the the nature of the activity that you're doing like burns if you're doing a campfire for example um they could be about the participants um that could be individual young people that could be the level of experience of the of the adults that are leading the activity or, or, or whatever um, or it could be to do with particular interactions between particular individuals um, and there could also be those external um, threats uh, that could be the weather it could be the public it could be you know, animals if you're in a park or a public space uh, and you can't control every aspect of that um, increasingly you know there are now risks that we're thinking about uh, managing and mitigating that are particular to outdoor activities that are kind of beyond our control but ones that we should definitely be thinking about and if we can just skip on to the next slide um you know certainly certainly around my way um up and down the mersey valley we're getting more and more um you know reports of things like giant hogweed which can be like really nasty um if young people Come across, if anybody comes across that and touches it and gets the sap, it can get this this photosensitivity and 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 really quite nasty skin burns and blisters. Um, we had a session in our local in our local kind of nature reserve um, a couple of weeks ago, and for the first time, kids came back with with ticks, um, which we hadn't got on our risk assessment because it wasn't a thing that had ever happened before. But now they just seem to be spreading. Um, you know, part of this is um you know the nature of the lack of management of our of our public spaces um and on and our wild areas um often lots of one of the things lots of groups seem to really enjoy doing um is is wild swimming swimming in open water um you know what that suddenly feels like a really bad idea um you know i can think of summers that we've gone swimming you know paddling bathing in the mersey I wouldn't do it today. Um, we know that the quality of, of public water is, is a really uh, is a really live issue. Um, and as we find you know, very very demonstrably that the impact of climate change is, is becoming real. Um, you know, anyone who was at international camp in 2022 um, can remember the you know the impact of the of, of the wind that got that got up there. But actually, had we had that camp um you know even just a couple of weeks earlier when there'd been 
a very significant heat wave that would have been a very different camp in terms of managing the impact of things like heat stroke on our in, on our young people and actually on our vulnerable volunteers as well um, all of those are particular to outdoor activities or predominantly outdoor activities and you need to be starting to think what are those additional risks inherent in the activity um, that you might want to think about controlling um, and you might want to think about mitigation um, I'll just go back to the you know the theory of um of risk assessment and of, of of that kind of control of the hazard um there's this concept called the hierarchy of control that i'm sure many of you have come across before but the idea is that you know the most effective of these is to totally remove the hazard just don't don't do the thing um and then these these things get steadily less impactful in terms of the hazard um and your job when you're risk assessing or when you're leading the process of risk assessment is to is to decide at which stage of this hierarchy effectively um you're trying to control the risk so you know you yep that's fine so the theory is that elimination is the most effective so just not doing that thing is by far and away the best way of avoiding the risk um wearing gloves or visors or life jackets or whatever it happens to be is the least effective way of of um of controlling the risk but it doesn't mean that it's not the right one because at the end of the day you can you know you can control the risk of drowning in open water by not going into open water but then you won't have the experience you can think about how you do it you can think about the controls you put in place but ultimately there's still a risk of drowning there and you know a life jacket is is the correct way to do that um you know thinking about specific activities so skip on to the next slide lauren um my pioneers at lockerbrook building a bushcraft area and making a campfire brilliant if you go to lockerbrook there's now a fire pit it's great um my pioneers built it we had great fun um the simplest way of eliminating any risk to do with having a fire is just not to have one but that would be boring um you could do substitution you could have a fire with like little led flickering bite lights but would that be as fun would that teach young people to manage that risk appropriately maybe not then we get onto the physical controls and the administrative controls so you do that thing of going and everybody's going to sit two weeks you know two meters away from the fire and if you're going to get up and walk around you're going to get up and walk around the back of the circle rather than across the middle of the fire pit that's physical control that's administrative control um and finally you could have protect, protective equipment you can see emmy is not wearing protective equipment there she is poking it with a stick when i was putting the frying pan on the fire i was wearing fire gloves um but that's the final and the kind of the the least impactful tool in your in your arsenal so it's you know not a kind of rigorous you should always go through these in a in a very linear manner but just to bear in mind about the kind of the theory and practice of of, of how you're thinking about controlling a risk can we eliminate it and still have the learning outcome the benefit the enjoyment of the thing that we were planning to do probably not in most cases could we do something slightly different can we change the way that we do it if you can't then that's the point at which you go right well can we wear gloves life jackets visors goggles chain mail whatever it is um you know have that in your mind when you consider the protective sorry the mitigations that you're putting in place um are we going back to oh no sorry um we were talking and there's a whole nother webinar about this that we did just a couple of weeks ago around dynamic risk assessment which i noticed there's something that that, that nancy flagged up um there are the time you know the um the written risk assessment that you've all done and you've all shared and is a living breathing document that everyone's obviously fully bought into um is mostly about dealing with the things that you know are potential risks there is always that case that there's going to be the unknown unknowns um so you might arrive at a place that you think you know well and there's adverse weather or there's been a landslip or there's a big old bull in the next field that you that wasn't there last time you come that's the time that you need what we call dynamic risk assessment that is doing it you know there and then in the moment 
it's not a substitute. It's not an alternative to having that written plan in advance. Um, you're doing either just before you do that activity, you're going, is it still safe to do that thing with the reservoir at that height or with the river at that height? Um, or you're doing it while it's happening. You're on the walk and the clouds are rolling in. Um, you are by definition rep responding to that changing or unpredictable situation. Um, how effective that is depends on how experienced and skilled the leaders are who are doing it. And that's the time that it's less of a shared um, process. It's more about the people who have been in this situation before, the people who know about how to manage you know, adverse weather or, uh, at altitude or who know about swimming in open water. Um, they are the people you should be listening to and looking to to make those judgments. Um, because it's not written, um, the communication is key. What are you doing to share that and share that understanding, um, both with the other volunteers who you're expecting to effectively fall into line? That feels very unwoodcrafty, but you know, you're the people with the experience and the knowledge, and you've made a judgment about that. How are you communicating that? to your fellow volunteers, but also to the young people and going, no, we're no longer doing that. I know you're looking forward to it, but it's not safe. Um, what are you going to communicate? What's the key messages? How are you going to do that? And who needs to know? Um, usually we don't write that down. Um, it's not recorded. Um, it's, it's typically oral. Um, but what's really good practice, because it's going to have an impact on how you assess that thing in the future is to go back and, and report back, talk to whoever completed the written risk assessment and go, oh, you know, that thing happened a bit like with our ticks, actually. Um, you know, I got a message after the thing going, it all went well, apart from the fact that we had this. Um, so that's now on the risk assessment because the things that were unpredictable that we didn't know were going to happen, they've now kind of come into that scope of what is possible. Uh, and so they should be on the risk assessment that, we, that we've written for that sort of activity when we do it again, um, because typically in Woodcraft we will be doing you know, the same sort of activities, not in exactly the same sort of way, um, but we'll do them you know, next summer or next winter or next autumn or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, I shall hand back to Lauren, I think, who's going to talk a little bit about um, following up after after the after an incident or a near miss. Lauren. I've just unmute myself. Thanks, Owen. Um, so yeah, just go through to go through the kind of flow chart, I guess, of what kind of the timeline of what we might think about when we're when we're involved in an incident or we have a sort of near miss at one of our activities. This is kind of the same whether it's indoors or outdoors, but kind of more more things in this areas uh, tend to happen when we're outdoors and we're away from our kind of normal meeting space maybe at a camp or maybe in the local park or on a hike as people have already alluded to so in the moment obviously that should be our kind of priority of what we do right then when the incident has happened so if needed administer first aid or any other support that might be needed in that moment and ensure the safety of the rest of the group so if one person has hurt themselves don't have the rest of the group crowding around that person um, and crowding around the first aider who's trying to get out the first aid kit and administer first aid. So ensuring that we've got the correct or, you know, uh, more than sufficient adult to child ratio is really important there to have enough adults to take care of the rest of the group whilst um, those others and those maybe first aiders can, can deal with the situation in the moment afterwards check back in with the young person or the young people that were involved in the incident make sure that their parents and carers know about any injury or any treatment given or any other kind of support that we may have given if a young person's had a panic attack or something like that we won't be necessarily talking about an injury but we definitely want to let parents and carers know that that has happened so that they can keep an eye um, on their young person as well Make sure that we are looking at what needs to be recorded and what might need reporting to folk officers. So if you have uh, an incident where you need to get out the first aid kit and apply a plaster, a bandage, an eye wash, something like that, you definitely want to note that down so that, number one, you remember when you're reporting that back to the parent and carers afterwards, but also so that you've got it on file um, and you can remember that. 
Owen can correct me if I'm wrong, but folk office don't need to be there if you've just um, put on a plaster or kind of put some bite cream on an insect bite or done an eye wash. If you need to take the young person to a hospital or the young person needs to seek kind of professional medical advice after the um, incident's taken place, then it would be really useful for you to let us know uh, by emailing safeguarding at woodcraft.org.uk. Uh, so that that can then be followed up if needed and recorded in a um, appropriate manner. Uh, and then yeah, that's also, that's sorry. spot on, Lauren. Um, I think that you know the, the the rule of thumb is if you open your first aid kit, then you should be filling in a form um, and sharing that information with the parent or carer afterwards uh, and keeping that for your own records. Um, the you know the the line is if there is any kind of follow up from from medical professionals, whether that's calling NHS one 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 or whether that's a GP visit or an outpatient clinic, that's when we need to have that record uh, centrally. That's not because we're you know going to launch an investigation and send the lads round and, and and tell you you should have done things differently, um, but practically if it's an injury to a child, um, there is effectively they have until the child is 21 to come back there's normally like a limitation of three years after an injury for them to for somebody to say oh you know the first data was negligent and and, and whatever um in the case of a child that's three years after their 18th birthday so we just need to make sure that we have that contemporaneous record of what was done um so that we can hold that centrally um, and Andy, our last head of centres, had actually, you know, had had this happen. Someone came back, you know, 15 years after an injury to say, oh, actually, it wasn't handled properly at the time. And that's why I've been having this recurrent back pain. Um, but because the information had been kept, that went, meant that we were able to, that the, the organisation was able to defend it um, and say they had acted properly. Um, so realistically, if that's kept locally for you know 10 15 years the likelihood of you being able to locate it in the event of a future query uh is possibly um a bit speculative which is why we ask you in that instance to log it centrally so that we can keep it you know by ear and have a and have a, a record of it so that if the organization is called to account at some future date we can demonstrate that we took the appropriate step. I think the last point that we were just on here was about kind of reflecting. So after we've done reporting, we've dealt with the incident in the moment, we've checked back in with that young person, let parents carers know, we'll check back in with the volunteer, because sometimes it's volunteers who have incidents too. Um, and then, yeah, reported it where it needs to be reported or written it down and then reflecting on it. So as Owen was kind of saying, is there anything that we can add to our risk assessment that would make a similar event not happen in the future? Or is there anything that we can reflect on to ensure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again? Some things, you know, we can try to mitigate the risk as much as possible, but as we just said, even from doing the activity, you know, there there is a risk, but the experience is often um, kind of worth mitigating some risks. So now moving on to where we can find some more support. So I've already kind of mentioned the first aid uh, guidance page, which is really useful on the website. There's also a whole section uh, on the website. It's all around camping and residentials. Lots of that will be uh, relatable for outdoor activities as well. So in that section, if you go up to the top right hand corner on the home page of the website and you'll see a little drop down that's called core groups. In there, you can just click camping and residentials and you'll find advice, guidance, policies, procedures, templates as Owen just mentioned that are in Google Docs. Uh, you'll also find the camping and residential checklist which we require all groups to fill in when they're planning an overnight trip away. Um, so check out that part of the website. There's also things on there such as um, uh, kind of what's the word PDFs and templates that you can send out to volunteers who are maybe new to doing activities. Uh, outdoors or new to coming on camps and residentials with us and so really useful kind of basic information for people who are new um, and why we do risk assessment. Also really great to direct other volunteers and head over yourself if you haven't already to the National Youth Agency Safeguarding Hub. Again lots of advice and guidance on there. There is the uh, level one 
safeguarding training, online training for volunteer youth workers, which is really kind of practical stuff for Woodcraft Folk Volunteers as it's aimed at volunteers. So you can do that course online through the MYA Safeguarding Hub. There's also stuff on there around kind of standards, looking again at kind of templates for different activities um, and how we can stay safe um, and the online training, as I mentioned. Uh, final one to have a look at, although there's loads of stuff out there, is the Outdoor Education Advisors Panel, which gives kind of detailed advice and guidance, looks at specific outdoor activities, such as I was mentioned, kind of wild swimming, going on hikes, that those kinds of things that all of our groups like to do. So they kind of give advice and case studies and tips and tips and tricks on doing some outdoor activities. There's also some more templates and checklists that you can have a look at, including ones around sort of coach travel. I think I saw one recently about how to sort of travel together on a minibus and a coach and the best kind of tips for doing that. And they've also got some FAQs about how to kind of use best practice when doing activities outdoors. So Owen's going to tell us why we're, yeah. why we're looking at these things now. Thanks. Um, I mean, I, I really would, if you're thinking, you know, you're looking forward to a camp or, or or something over the over the summer. I really would check out the OEAP stuff. Um, I was looking at it just this week, and they've they've added even more stuff um, in terms of just that kind of fact sheets, a couple of couple of sides of quite succinctly written advice on all manner of stuff um, to do with doing outdoor or, or otherwise adventurous activities, which is really the kind of you know industry best um ways of doing things um as in you know yeah as lauren said there's stuff about wild swimming there's stuff about you know going to trampoline parks and there's stuff about you know um detailed stuff around around particular activities but there's also stuff around uh, which is very relevant to us uh, to the way that we work with our particularly our older young people so there's stuff on there around um you know they, they, they've got some really good results some common sense resources around around trans inclusion they've got some really good common sense resources around young people in relationships and good practice advice to to to, to um to follow when you've got you know, you're doing a residential activity and you know that there's there's two young people who are romantically involved it's actually a really good common common sense um thing to look at they've got stuff around um i don't know do the groups do what we call parachute drops where you you know you you drop your your young people and let them navigate to a point um they've got some really good advice about what they call remote supervision so how to keep kids safe when they're actually testing the boundaries of their own independence and they're looking at um you know you're providing them supervision but you're not watching them every moment which is really relevant to the stuff that we're doing with with particularly our ventures and dfs um so do go and check it out because it goes probably further and deeper than some of the generic like woodcraft advice that we've that we've given um so if you've if you've got a query by all means drop us a line um but actually look at that oeap stuff first because that's probably where we'll base any kind of a response on um sorry for that diversion um i was going to talk about um the 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 london inquiry i don't i don't know is everybody aware of this it was it was it was a big thing because the lad was from stockport just just near me um so ben leonard was a was a 16 year old um venture scout um who died following falling from a cliff um on a on an expedition on the great orm in north wales uh, back in 2018 um for one reason or another the the inquest has only just reported um and the verdict of the of the inquest was that he was unlawfully killed effectively by by the organization um because there were serious failings found in terms of the uh the control of the risks associated with that, acti that activity the dynamic risk assessment the vetting of the leaders the training of the leaders and all of those things um whilst 
obviously the death of a of of, of a young person is tragic. Um, it has a very significant impact. The coroner's report and the subsequent probable change in in the regulation that we work under as a as a as a youth organisation. Um, the coroner has highlighted the importance of risk assessment and the importance of documenting that, the importance of planning and briefing um, for participants and leaders, and the extent to which they could evidence that procedures and policies had been followed. Um, and that was an area where the scouts were were held up to to some scrutiny and and came in for some criticism. Um, it's fair to say, I mean, the scouts have have, have responded with a very detailed summary of, of all the things that they're doing to change and try and make sure that nothing could ever like that could ever happen again. Um, however, I think there is a there's an imperative on organizations outside of the scouting movement, including ourselves, to make sure that we're holding ourselves up to the same kind of scrutiny and the same kind of um of of forensic examination of, of of the way that we work now i think you know there will be in time um potentially new requirements or new demands made of us as an organization in terms of how we evidence that um those are probably a couple of years down the line um not least with a change of government um we will now be you know a new team of civil servants will now be looking at the implications of all of that um and will be coming out with recommendations for how that should change we are working i am working with um the the national safeguarding network um to try and understand and get ahead of the game and potentially influence that conversation because it's for us it's all about a balance between minimizing the risk to young people in our activities but also being realistic about how much we can deliver and how much we can regulate when we are working with a volunteer workforce who are giving up their time for nothing um, in order to provide opportunities for young people going back to the idea of elimination and substitution you could make youth work very very safe by only ever sitting in circles in drafty church halls playing parachute games um, there is a learning, there, there is a development that is happening with our young people. When we do adventurous things in open country, we have to do that safely, but we recognise that there is an importance in doing it and we want to be able to keep doing it in a in a way that is safe but is controlling the risks proportionally. So that's, you know, that's a conversation that's ongoing. Um, however, what we are doing um changes that have been made recently um you will see if you've gone away on camp uh in the last year or so we're now asking you to complete a checklist which we've not done before um but we're now asking whoever's responsible for leading that activity to complete a checklist a simple you know exercise on our website just to notify us that you're taking kids away and that the the basic expectations the minimum expectations that we put in place have have been met um, and that we've got a document of that. Um, it's on it's on the website. You'll find it in that residential activities page. Um, so if you're not doing that already, please please do. Um, usually you get a response from Lauren or I going, looks like you've got it all under control. That's great. But if you've got questions or queries, that's a that's a really good place to just put. There's a little notes notes bit where you can go. I'm not really sure about this, um, or you can. You, know, you can tell us that you're having trouble with a particular bit and we can we can help or arrange a call or, or provide you some advice. Um, we're also looking at the kind of criteria for the activities that, that we need to know about before you do them. Um, our insurers have typically given a list of you know the activities that they expect and we ask you to yeah, you know, when you re-register your group each year to go, are you doing anything that doesn't neatly fit into this list? Um, looking at the group's, you know, responses to that, people have come back with things around, you know, wild swimming is a is a, is a prime example, uh, and maybe we're going to be coming to a point where we want to know about those things in advance so we can just make sure that your approaches are 
are sound and are consistent with good practice. Um, there's a process of reflecting and learning on, on the instance of near misses, which is the other reason um, why it's really important. You tell us about stuff that has happened, stuff that's gone wrong. Um, partly it's that documenting it in case someone comes after us at some later date, but actually everything that happens, every incident that takes place, builds up a picture of where we're really good at dealing with stuff, but also where we've got some stuff to learn. Um, the other, the impact of that of that residential checklist is actually knowing and understanding a little bit more about what we're doing at a local level um, so that we can build build a picture and build a profile of our risk which helps us to have those conversations with our insurers because it's getting increasingly hard to source insurance for the sort of activities that we do led by volunteers we're now i think we're now down to each year we have a choice between basically two insurers um, but actually we're now working with with an insurer and with a broker who is particularly good at giving advice and proactive advice and being very helpful and supportive um, in terms of giving us advice that enables us to keep doing the thing rather than go, oh no, that's a risk too far, um, which would be the easy, the easy response. Um, so we're really lucky to have the insight of, of Gallicas, who's our specialist broker, um, and um, in some places, external experts as well. So we've got, you know, within our, again, hugely diverse and talented volunteer group, we've got health and safety specialists, we've got safeguarding specialists who give us the benefit of our expertise when they, when we have a query that is beyond. We will be, as, as a youth organisation, us and the scouts, the guides and the boys brigade and the space cadets and anyone else you, you, you care to mention, will be, as as we go on, under a level of accountability at this organisational level for the stuff that we do that carries the risk. Um, there will therefore be an increased expectation that volunteers train and demonstrate that they've undergone that training. And that's kind of, in a sense, you know, it feels like we're laying on it, laying it on quite thick. But what we're just trying to do is prepare to make sure that we've got a good story to tell when we are asked questions along with the rest of the sector about how well we are responding, how well we are controlling the risk and how much we can demonstrate that and how confident we can be that we're demonstrating that appropriately. Um, because there will be greater regulation of, of, of what we do. We are hoping that that will be supportive and light touch but the better the story that we can tell, the more chance we have of negotiating for that supportive and light touch regulation uh, rather than a, a, a sledgehammer to, to, to crack a nut. Um, it's vitally important that uh, young people continue to have opportunities of the sort that we offer, um, which are by and large low risk and by and large hugely beneficial. Um, and that's what we want to preserve. Um, Lauren, I think there's got, yeah, just kind of key key contacts. Um, if you've got anything you need to report to us, even if it is a couple of weeks after the event, you know, that's fine. We're here to document and support, not to kind of beat you with a stick. Um, but also if you want to ask queries in advance, um, the safeguarding email address um, is, usually the best one because that will go to three or four of us most senior members of staff um if i'm out of the office then it will be picked up by somebody else we try to get back to you within a day or so um on that email address um heading into the camping season if you've got stuff about volunteer status group um queries dbs and screening queries uh, membership at wordcraft.org.uk is the place to go for that that will go through to Leanne and uh, Rosie, who will be able to interrogate the database and tell you what's going on. Um, if you want specific advice about going away overnight, um, residentials, which will go to uh, Lauren and myself, um, we are probably some of the more experienced campers in Woolcroft folk. Um, between the two of us, we've probably got, what, 50 years camping experience notched up. Um, 
if we don't know the answer, we can put you in touch with somebody who does. Um, and we're always much happier to be contacted with a query or a, a concern in advance uh, than to be told that something's gone horribly wrong afterwards. We've kind of covered some of the things that people said they wanted to like, you know, cover at, at, at the top of the